get started. Hopefully everyone had a chance to complete the poll. If not, please keep doing that while I speak. Um, welcome, this is Evenings with Environmentalists. This is our final event of the three-part series where we have been exploring a lot of important issues surrounding climate change, food sustainability, and this is our final event where we will talk about how to build sustainable behaviors. And it's gonna be super exciting. We have amazing panelists with us today. And before we get started, I want to uh, introduce our student moderators. Firstly, my name is Mashia Ahmed. I'm a sophomore at Hopkins studying behavioral biology. I'm an intern at Homewood Recycling. Talia, if you wanna go next. Yeah, I'm Talia. I'm an intern with the Office of Sustainability and I'm a sophomore who's studying international studies and environmental studies. Thank you. Just a side note before we get started with our main event, at any point, if you wanna speak, please feel free to unmute yourself and share. If not, the chat option is always open. Towards the second half of our event, we will open it, open it up for our audience to ask any questions. So you can also wait for that. Uh, now moving on to our wonderful panelists for today. We have two amazing speakers. First of all, we have Dr. Pandyan, who is the department chair in anthropology and the director of Hopkins Ecological Design Collective, which brings so social scientists, engineers, designers, students, and activists together for, for collaborative projects. In his work, Dr. Pandyan investigates the pro problem of environmental ethics. He is the author of many books, including his most recent, A Possible Anthropology Methods for Uneasy Times, where, as he explains, he explores the discipline's commitment to human humanity yet to come. We also have Dr. Kennedy, who is a professor in the Health, Behavior, and Society Department at the School for Public Health. As tobacco control researcher interested in the role policy plays in addressing global tobacco epidemic, he works in low and middle income countries through he works in low and middle income countries through his role with the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. Domestically, he has a program of research with the FDA's Center for Tobacco Con Programs working to understand e-cigarettes advertising of products featuring including flavors. He also oversees a global policy scan to understand how countries or jurisdiction are regulating these emerging nicotine delivery systems. Thank you both for joining us. We would love to open up the floor for you to briefly introduce your primary work, why it's important to you, and also what shaped your career interest. Dr. Pandian, if you would want to get us started. Sure thing. Thank you so much for the invitation, first of all, and for the chance to, to speak with you all. This is, uh, it's, it's wonderful that you've had this uh, series this fall on such an uh, essential set of topics that too, given the circumstances that we're in right now. So kudos to you for organizing the series. I am a cultural anthropologist. I've been at Hopkins for over a dozen years, and I would definitely say that I have thought of myself as an environmentalist for pretty much all of my adult life. And I was more involved in environmental activist work and nonprofit work when I was younger. And it was actually, in some ways, a frustration with some of what I saw doing that work when I was younger that actually led me into anthropology. I, I had the feeling that so often when it came to environmental work, we were wrestling with certain ideas about people, about the problems that people have, about the difficulty of changing people in the ways that we think they need to be changed and the stubbornness of what it was that people felt that they wanted to do or had to do and, um, and, and really certain assumptions about the fixity of human nature that I was a little troubled with in part because I, there wasn't always room to ask the question under what circumstances do these assumptions apply and also because of course people live in, in very different ways in different places and they carry with them different histories and different commitments and different values by virtue of the experiences uh, that they have and so it was with an interest in trying to come at the question of human nature from a more expansive and maybe critical vantage point that I turned to anthropology and though I've written over the last 
many years on various kinds of things, uh, done various kinds of research, I would really say that the underlying thread that unites these different projects is in fact a commitment to environmental ethics, to the question of what it takes to nurture an ecological sensibility, to cultivate ecological awareness, to think in a more open and expansive sense about the relationship between oneself and the rest of the world. And what I've been doing in my research is pursuing, you might say, a, a series of, of investigations of both the limits of that kind of awareness as well as uh, the question of what it takes to, uh, to change that up a bit and um, to, to, to develop, say, uh, a more uh, ecological uh, sensibility. Did I jump in then? If that's okay, thanks. Um, I, I didn't know if anyone wanted to follow up with any questions. I think we're a small, a small enough group tonight. And like um, we heard, if people want to raise their hand or interrupt at any point, I, I think we're cool with that. Uh, I'm Ryan Kennedy. I, I am faculty in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And you heard a lot about the work I do right now that's in the corner of tobacco control. You might scratch your head a little bit and think, what on earth are these? How does that have to play with environmental issues? My undergrad is actually in environmental studies. I um, have an undergrad. I studied in, in Canada uh, where the field of geography is a very common uh, undergrad. I think it's less common in the US. I think some of my colleagues have said, you can't, you can't major in that here. So uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but uh, I, I loved rocks and dirt and all things uh, ecology when I was an undergrad. And I ended up. Um, having some interesting work experiences during my undergrad, uh, working for Ministry of Environments. Um, and I did a lot of air quality work uh, and became a bit of an air quality scientist. I, I studied air pollution and how it flowed through um, air sheds, like, which were like watersheds, and uh, trying to understand how um, different plumes of pollutants would um, transport up and down the province of British Columbia when I lived there. Uh, and years later, sort of evolving and ending up working in um, public health um, uh, and ended up working in tobacco control. Cigarettes are a lot like smokestacks. They're just smaller. Mm. Uh, and you can study the smoke in a very similar way. Um, I, I continue a line of research that's related to trying to understand behavior. And behavior is obviously very important for environmental issues and also for public health issues. Uh, I teach a class at the um, Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, called Program Planning for Health Behavior Change. And in that class, we do a lot of uh, the classic health behavior change theories, trying to understand what and how you might leverage some behavioral theory when you design interventions to try and um, encourage or um, encourage good behavior or discourage bad behavior. Um, I, think, um, I think a lot of the work I do now uh, we consider human behavior and how to motivate and shift uh, more sustainable practices um, and also the role sort of structural changes can play for some of those behavioral changes um, as well as the role policy can play. Um, and so it just, to, just to sort of wrap it up in terms of what I do now, we know um, tobacco smoke pollution is a really um, horrible thing to be exposed to, like, like secondhand smoke. Um, and you can do lots and lots of campaigning or leverage lots of what you know about human behavior and try and um, leverage social norms and things like that to get people not to use cigarettes in certain environments. Or you can pass a policy and say you can't. <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, we've certainly um, seen the benefit of approaching it in different, um, it, trying to address things in different ways. So I, I'm excited to have a chat tonight about um, what and how we can apply some of the things that we do in public health to more specific or direct environmental corners. But um, I would always argue that we're all we're all trying to do the same thing. You can't be you can't have public health if you don't have environmental health. So. Thank you both so much for those introductions. Um, we're just going to get started by asking a a couple of questions to guide the discussion. Um, and so while we're asking you guys questions, um, if the audience would like to ask a follow up or have any questions in general, um, you can type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, 
And then also once we are done with like our moderated questions, we're just gonna open it up for audience led Q and A. Um, so the first, the first big question is, um, how do we build sustainable behavior change and what could be some examples of these behaviors or how do we define sustainable behaviors? Those are big questions. <laughs> and then you'd want to take a, a first swing in this one and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are big questions. And, and, um, and to be honest, uh, I, I'm still working at answers that I feel are uh, compelling enough. I feel like I'm still at a stage in my life where I have more questions than I have answers with regard to these problems. But I do think that it's important to stay with the questions a bit. What do we mean by sustainable change? Do we mean change that we conceive as contributing to sustainability in an environmental sense? Or do we mean change that's itself sustainable? That is to say, uh, forms of transformation that have enough force and momentum about them that they have a kind of endurance. Uh, I, I think that one thing that I've learned as an anthropologist is that it is really important to begin where people are, that regardless of how we might feel as individuals, as researchers, as social critics, as environmentalists or whatever, about what it is that people do, whether good or bad, they have their reasons, they have their commitments, their habits are grounded in lifetimes of experience. And unless we can kind of begin with people where they are and build up an understanding of how they've gotten as committed as they've gotten to the forms of behavior that, that they have. Um, any effort to sort of just come in and say, this is what you should be doing instead may well be met with a fair amount of skepticism. And this is indeed, I think what we see in this country right now with regard to political polarization and the way in which uh, environmental questions often become a peculiar kind of flashpoint. So all the uh, ways in which um, plastic straws, for example, became uh, conservative memes, uh, a kind of conservative meme in this country this year, people sort of like brandishing the, um, uh, the number of straws that they use and, and the wantonness with which they throw them away just to kind of you know, give it to the environmentalists a bit. Um, this may seem grating, but it might also have to do with the attitudes that we're mustering up in trying to encourage certain forms of change. And, and in my experience in working as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist with people who are themselves engaged in practices of social change, what I've noticed is that techniques that work often seem to work because they engage people emotionally, they engage people affectively, they tap somehow into the current of feeling and sentiment that people already have and find a way of channeling that in some other direction. Everyone, regardless of how nihilistic they might seem, is attached to something or other. And I think the challenge is often finding a bridge between the attachments that we have as environmentalists and the attachments that other people live with. And I think that artists and activists who do this work successfully do it successfully because they're able to make that act effective bridge between different forms of care. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kennedy, if you'd like to. Uh, you right, remind me, I mean, the, the last question there was like, what or how do we address sustainability? <laughs> yeah, I can remind you, sorry, that was a loaded question. So we'll break it down a little it's bit. It's not though. loaded, it's just big. <laughs> okay, um, um, how do we build sustainable behavior change and what could be some examples of these behaviors or how do we define sustainable behaviors? Yeah, okay, so it's maybe, maybe it's helpful to um, talk about this in the context of an example. 
Um, and, and something that I teach in one of my classes is sort of what and how we actually went from just putting everything in the trash to source severing our waste so that we um, pulled out recyclables and maybe compostables depending on where you live at the curbside. Um, I think a lot of us in academia or, and certainly a lot of us that um, sit in that public health corner, we're, we're, we're very comfortable with data. We really love to tell people facts. And uh, I think a lot of times we think what's necessary is to just tell people what they need to know. And then if they know that, they will do the right thing, right? There's this, um, what's it called? The fallacy of the empty vessel, right? The idea that there's just people walking around with their mouths open, ready for us to pour information into them. And if we just, you know, hit their mouths right as they're moving, we'll, we'll be um, successful. Uh, and we, you know, we do this all the time in tobacco control. You know, what, what are the health warnings that we sometimes put on tobacco packs? We tell them how many you know, constituents of pollutants are in, you know, a cigarette pack or something. We love giving them, them numbers and things like that. Um, what, what we know, um, uh, what, what works for something like um, waste management is not so much the telling people, you know, your neighborhood produces this many um, tons of waste every year and this many tons could be diverted. Um, what works is sort of making the behavior normal, right? If we begin to um, present a new behavior and somehow can communicate that other people do this and that by doing it, you're somehow within a social norm. Um, and the benefit of something like recycling, especially in a, an environment where it's curbside and po possibly you can see your neighbors, we know that once you had a certain threshold for once you had a certain you know proportion of neighbors that are doing it it's no longer sort of a fringe behavior or unusual behavior it's considered normal um, and recycling and composting are just so visually affirming because you can see that your neighbors are doing it and if and they can see if you're not doing it um, and so some of the the strategies for encouraging sustainable behavior um, and not to say we have to have the, uh, the equivalent of a recycling bin in front of us all the time, but it, it's the process of identifying what or how we can change our environment, what or how we can change our systems and motivations such that people are motivated to do the behavior and we don't really necessarily care um, whether they care, <laughs> I guess, in some ways. Um, we're very, you know, and especially students in, uh, um, and studying, we, we want to know the reasons why we're sort of uh, the pursuit of knowledge is in, in very much inherent to uh, what people are doing in a place like the Homewood campus at Johns Hopkins University. Um, but if we're really in pursuit of um, changes to behaviors that we know are going to continue us or help us along the path to more sustainable behavior, sustainable living, um, we, have to, we have to strategically think about the implementation of some of these things. Thank you. Um, I, the next question is for you, Dr. Kennedy, um, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about um, like thinking we can just educate people and that'll be enough to make them change their behavior. Um, so why is that all, not always the case? Um, and is there a more effective way than others in terms of like educating people? Um, I guess, like, how do we meet people where they are? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 first of all, it sort of depends what we're trying to ha have people do, right? And there's, there's different sort of um, motivation. So I, I think it's really important to consider the types of behaviors we're trying to encourage. Um, and so, you know, if we want people, for example, to ride their bikes to work instead of driving their personal vehicles, um, it's, uh, you know, what one of the things we do and we love to do in public health is a needs assessment, right? We, we strategically try and, um, it's also say, we could call it market research too, right? We have to ask the right questions. An anthropologist or an ethnographer would totally appreciate that you only get information that's worthwhile if you ask the right question, right? <laughs> People don't always um, know what they need to tell you so that you can design an intervention or something to um, perfectly orient it. I think, um, I think we, we, need to, we need to be able to um, understand what motivates people 
Uh, and we need to acknowledge that often people don't know what motivates themselves. Um, I think we need to um, key into what we know from social science in terms of what and how people behave. Uh, I think we need to, I think we need to, in a perfect world, really key in um, to aligning certain behaviors with things that are important to other people. Um, and so, you know, I had a boss when I worked for the Ministry of Environment and he was a conservationist. So one of the things that he really liked to do uh, or what it, his job was, was to try and protect um, environment, like spaces in the environment, right? And we do that through parks. We do that through um, protected areas. In some cases, we do it from individuals buying land and putting it aside. And he worked for Ducks Unlimited, um, which is an NGO uh, that is really, really dedicated to protecting habitat for ducks. And a lot of the people that support that NGO, um, all of those, the, all of the people that support the NGO want to protect wetlands. They want to protect, you know, marshes, places that are necessary for habitat for these birds. Um, a lot of the people that like to protect it are hunters. And a lot of them are conservationists that may, might be better, better um, characterized as environmentalists. And he always said he didn't care um, why they were doing it. He, he wanted to protect the wetlands. Um, and so you, we can accomplish the same goal sometimes by understanding how to frame our, what we want to get done, um, understanding our markets and understanding what's gonna motivate people um, and like we said at the onset, like sort of meeting people where they are at the beginning and helping to move them forward as opposed to trying to drag them right to the end. Um, okay, so next question is for Dr. Bandian. Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but um, essentially also kind of drawing back to Bridget's um, question in the chat, um, but some sustainable behavior changes are easier to adapt for those that have more resources, money, or time. Um, do you agree? And if so, how can we address the inequities of behavior change? Well, I think addressing inequity has to begin with an examination of who we are in relation to other people. We're having a conversation within Johns Hopkins, which is one of the most powerful agents in the city, of course, and, and the state, and itself the agent of a great deal of, uh, of exploitation, at least uh, in, the, in the perception of many people who live right here in this city. What do we do with that? What do we do with the forms of inequality that we're already saddled with? as people positioned in a particular way in the world, how do we make that awareness part of the ground with which we work? I was, uh, I, after college, I went and spent, I've done a lot of my research in rural places around the world, especially in rural India. And I was working for a year after college with an NGO in rural India on a project financed by the World Bank that was dedicated to trying to improve relationships, ecological, environmental relationships between people who lived in these villages alongside a mountain forest reserve and the, the needs of that, of, that, um, of that forest preserve. And there are all these assumptions that were smuggled into a project like that about what people ought to do and what they ought not to do, which honestly had very little awareness about the everyday ways in which people were already interacting with that environment. There was a sense, for example, that the, uh, that the environment to protect kind of began at a certain boundary and everything else outside of it was just wasteland. And yet the people who I got to know in these villages knew dozens and dozens of medicinal plants and other kinds of things that grew in these other landscapes that the people involved in these projects just simply didn't even care about. So I think once again, if one is entering into any situation with a fixed sense of what is necessary and treating then the people who live in that situation as objects of manipulation, 
objects by means of which we're going to get to that predefined goal, um, that to me perpetuates the kind of imperialism, frankly, that so much uh, of the Western environmental traditions still uh, inherits and still embodies. We need to find ways of reinventing our own environmental commitments, our own environmental imaginations, our own environmental practices with a greater awareness of the wide range of ways and traditions and attachments and imaginations in relation to which people live in the world, live with its creatures, live with its resources. And I really believe that unless we're willing to do that kind of work, anything that we say in the name of uh, environmental justice, for example, will ultimately just be a kind of greenwashing because it doesn't yet involve the kind of good faith effort that I think that I've come to believe is necessary in actually learning how it is the people in less privileged positions actually live with their environments and their resources in the first place. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, um, I think, oh, uh, Mashiat had a question. Um, does incentivizing people work in the long term to create behavior change? Um, I think that's a good question. The, the, the caveat, the term for it, um, Incentives are often really effective for discrete behaviors. Um, if you want or need something done sort of once, maybe. Um, the, uh, the, um, the overuse of or over-reliance on incentives can discourage long-term behaviors when they're removed. Um, it's obviously very specific to what you're trying to accomplish, but those are, that's one of the caveats for something like that. Uh, and also, I, I mean, often when you're organizing some sort of effort to change behavior and you're trying to identify an incentive opportunity, the incentive has to be sort of internally consistent with what you're trying to do too, right? So if you're, um, if you're trying to get people to ride their bikes to work and the incentive is 50 cents off a gallon of gas for your, like, you know, it's, it's, it can't not jive like that. People, um, doesn't fly. I um is it Lena or Liana? Lena, how's there? You had asked about human-centered design, and I I think design is a really really important consideration, and sort of touches on some of the human factors that we've been talking about and trying to understand. But I, I was curious what you were thinking specifically for that. It was probably about something that was being said at the moment when you typed it in. Yeah, I was just sort of referring to um, what Anand was speaking about in terms of like, you know, not going in with a set, you know, um, idea of what the, the solution is or even what the problem is necessarily and like making sure that we're listening. Um, I think, you know, um, that is in, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have um, in the previous environmental and evenings with environmentalists, um, we were hearing about a lot of um, that extractive type of um, research and utilizing, you know, going into communities, particularly communities of color in Baltimore that have um, been the, um, the victim of research from Hopkins, you know, all the way, you know, from Henrietta Lacks and before and after. Um, and so really kind of like shifting that research no matter what type of research it is in terms of, you know, focusing on the humans and, um, and listening and, and kind of being, you know, having it be an iterative process. Mm -hmm. To me, if I could jump in on that, um, this is this is something that that a number of us are, are trying to begin to work on, and and it's it's very new, and and we're learning how to do this, and, and there are some of us in the social sciences involved, and there are folks in in engineering, and and uh, and in the natural sciences, and we've even got artists and designers uh, and activists here in the city who are also involved in some of this work, um, and I think that one lesson already has to do with the nature of, of partnerships and, and, and the extent to which we can really work in a thoroughly lateral or collaborative manner. Can we actually let our understanding of the problems grow collaborative, collaboratively? Can we let our understanding of possible pathways of change grow collaboratively? Can we put into place 
collaborative processes by means of which things move in one direction as opposed to another. You can think of all of those things with regard to other humans in a city like ours, and certainly to think about the relationship between uh, spaces of white privilege, such as our university and other communities in the city, that's absolutely central. You can also, I think, extend this kind of thinking to non-human actors, agents, beings, creatures as well. What would it mean to think of the streams and waterways of our city as potential collaborators in a project of remediation? That might seem like a loopy question to ask, but at a moment in the world where there are governments here and there around the world who are now recognizing the rights of rivers, for example, uh, this might be the kind of question that we have to begin to ask. How wide can we cast this net of potential collaboration? How can we extend or expand our own imaginations to take seriously the possibility that whatever it is that we want has to interface with the other ambient desires, tendencies, dispositions, commitments that are already out there, whether they are the commitments and desires of other people or in fact other, other creatures in the world. Um, just to give this one small example, and it gets back to Liana's question more specifically, I'm working very closely with a graduate student in anthropology here at Hopkins, uh, Nat Adams, who some of you may know, whose research is about urban greening here in the city. And his research wrestles with a particular paradox, which is that urban greening plans in the city take are sort of grounded in the idea that vacants are sites of blight uh, and that, sorry, they inherit a kind of history in which vacants are imagined as sites of blight and they try to reimagine those vacants instead as sites for the proliferation of green spaces uh, to, to let weeds grow, to let other kinds of um, uh, landscapes emerge in these places. But precisely because of these legacies of blight and neglect that those landscapes also carry, many urban African-American residents in some of these neighborhoods where these greening campaigns have unfolded are actually concerned when environmentalists come in and say, we should let it all go wild because to them, it recapitulates a certain legacy of neglect. And so here you have the clash of two different environmental visions two different senses of what it means to clean or remediate. And so one can't really work out what to do in a situation like that where the environmental imaginations are actually pulling in different directions, except to enter into processes of dialogue and collaborative co-visioning such that people can actually develop um, alternatives that, that they're all kind of on board with, but that takes time and it, it takes a kind of openness of, uh, of orientation that, I don't know, our agencies don't always have. Time and time to build relationships and trust. Um, finding common language <laughs> is like, yeah, it's uh, it, the, the way people perceive landscapes, especially is so different. We can look at the very same thing and one person can see a beautiful pollinator garden and another person sees something that they think is disorganized and being neglected. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, my neighborhood association does not like my front yard. <laughs> so. All right. Um, at this point, we're going to keep opening it up to the audience. Um, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. There was a question Dan asked about sort of um, uh, things like taxation and strategies there to sort of, um, um, we know, you know, I've been at WHO meetings where we're talking about priorities for policies around tobacco use and taxes is always presented as the most effective policy intervention to influence use, especially for young people. Um, young people are so price sensitive. Um, but of course, increasing taxes for folks that use these products, um, and especially in a context like North America, folk, um, if you use tobacco products like cigarettes, you're more likely to be lower income. Uh, and these taxes, the increased cost is, um, is really um, regressive. Like it's, it's, it hurts the people that it, um, 
that we don't typically want to hurt. Um, and yet um, they're still considered sort of the gold star policy. So we, we talk about um, issues around taxation for gasoline. Um, you know, gasoline in the US is so cheap relative to other places in the world. And uh, entire sort of healthcare systems are funded by taxation on the gasoline systems. Um, but you think about sort of things that are really, really keyed into the American identity and things like um, road trips and the ability to drive to other, you know, there's just so much emotion tied up in sort of that um, association with um, easy travel and how that is equated to freedom. Right, it's really our job in this area to figure out what and how we frame these things in a way that's going to resonate to the broader audience to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Um, I think I think gas should cost a dollar more a gallon, but <laughs> yeah, you know the 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 question of 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 vehicles is is a really interesting one because of the commitments to freedom of mobility mm -hmm. and so on, which are often American identity, real, I think. Right, and identity, but then, yeah. but then also um, you know, commitments to safety, yeah. which have a great deal to do with why vehicles in the United States are getting bigger and bigger year by year to the point where they are far more hazardous to pedestrians and bicyclists and others outside them, others essentially in smaller vehicles than our giant SUVs um, than they've ever been before. Yeah. And this is, this is really difficult. So how do, you, how do you deal with a situation in which people sort of looking to protect themselves produce effects that are more toxic to others? My feeling is that you can't address that effectively unless you wrestle with that idea, like that idea of self-protection. Like how do we take uh, an overly individualistic way of thinking about self-protection, self-expression and expand it to encompass those others who might be harmed uh, either by you know, contact with a vehicle out of control or more simply by what comes out of the tailpipe. Uh, and, and this is why my feeling as, as an environmentalist, but also as an anthropologist, is that at a certain point, we have to begin to reckon with culture, with what people do care about, with what they are attached to, because frankly, a lot of the problems that we face are of such a vast scale and scope and really require, I think, so much by way of radical social transformation that unless we're able to engage at that level of culture and commitment, I don't know, we might make incremental things happen, but will that be enough? I'm frankly rather skeptical, you know? So uh, I, I, my inclination is to try to do um, as much learning as possible and really to try to um, approach all of this with, with as much humility as possible. And with the specific example you're talking about with vehicles, it's really interesting too, because there's certainly a camp that would say, we just need to engineer our way out of these problems. We need to make them safer with the autonomous driving technologies. We need them, make them more sustainable in the way they're powered. Um, and, and that is probably, we are getting quite close on both of those fronts, but also those benefits will not be realized by everyone for a long time. And we further create um, a camp of maybe people that, who are safe and a camp that people are not, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's, and then, you know, that raises even deeper sort of um, cultural questions about equity and, um, you know, safe for whom, right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is interesting when it, cause it, I think there's again, human nature, we're very, um, uh, I remember talking to a surgeon once and, you know, the, there was an opportunity to either have like a surgical intervention um, that like 
sort of change some of your physiology or you got a physical implant. And the surgeon told me, you know, people trust implants. They like trust a device. You know, there's just this weird human nature where we, we think that having something, you know, a machine to fix things we're, we're very comfortable with for some reason. And uh, I remember thinking from a sort of a human risk perception that was a really interesting, I, cause I don't know if I feel like that, but this is a surgeon that's done, you know, something 5,000 times. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and I think people, people want vehicles to just fix themselves. They, we want that whole sort of area of issues. We want, we want technology to make our homes more energy efficient and, and address our climate issues from our transportation sector. Um, and almost, I think humans want to like, just sort of let some, like it will fix itself sort of. Um, we, and I don't think that's gonna happen for a long time. I don't know how we then in the environmental corner um, better address that because we can't argue the progress of those corners. Maybe it's arguing the sort of accessibility or um, uniformity of the access to the benefits there. We appeal to sort of that side of humanity. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm honestly kind of skeptical about the extent to which, I'm, gonna, I'm skeptical about the extent to which we can engineer our way out of these problems. I'm also skeptical about the extent to which we can put the right incentive structures in place and, and somehow calculate your, our, our way out precisely because of the gravity of what we're wrestling with. Um, I have I think, really come to believe that uh, we need some basic change in our imagination of the relationship between self and world, human and non-human. And I don't just say that in the abstract, I say it in part because I see that people who are working in that register do in fact have really interesting effects. I read, for example, a lot of speculative fiction. I read dystopian fiction. I, I, I'm interested in that. Um, you know, it isn't for everyone necessarily sort of <laughs> imagining what life is going to be like after everything falls apart. Um, but it's definitely, I get a kick out of it. And and you see how it is that these imaginations get into people's heads and they work on people in interesting ways. So if, for example, so much of our modern lives is grounded in the idea of sort of keeping everything in place and having everything organized and having everything have a particular purpose and ensuring that things work as efficiently as possible. What if you began from a very different set of assumptions about stuff that had spiraled so thoroughly out of control that the goal was instead to survive with what you had? Um, if you began instead with the assumption that the, bur- that the world was actually kind of broken and the question was, how do you put things back together in a way that, make, that makes it survivable? Um, this, I think, is where a lot of uh, speculative science fiction begins. But then, oddly enough, you know, I have a 12-year-old and, and, a, and a seven-year-old. She's going to be eight soon. And, and um, my daughter and I, the younger one and I, have been have started watching this new cartoon on Netflix, which is set in a future, uh, a series set in a future 200 years from now, uh, in which, like, kids are wandering around having to deal with the rubble of our civilization. Like, how did that, how did that become a series on Netflix, how did it get there? Um, it clearly has an audience. So I think that here and there, our culture is in fact full of little pockets, little openings for frankly, far more radical imaginations of environmental possibility and impossibility. And I think that part of our job as theorists, as researchers, uh, as academics is to find creative ways of tapping into those more radical currents of imagination and practice and seeing what we can do to give them a bit of a boost, to intensify, to call attention to, to ally with, um, and, and, that, and, and, and to, dis, to, to sort of disabuse ourselves of the notion that all the best ideas have to come from us. Mm-hmm. The, be- the best ideas might already be out there and maybe all we can do is sort of just give them a bit more of a leg up in the world. 
I think, yeah, I think we cannot underestimate the importance of design in these issues. Cause I think, and, and I, I mean that broadly, right? I think, I think we need to appeal to people's sensibilities, not just in practicalities, but also in these, these dimensions that you're talking about, um, things that make us excited, right? And in, in terms of how we reimagine urban spaces and how we reimagine um, systems. Uh, in place, and I, I think, I think you know the example that was put forward. You know, if if we can address barriers by making the the better choice, the easy choice, um, but how do we make it better? It's not always just in these like economic measures or these um, temporal measures. Um, we we can appeal to beauty. We can appeal to um, things that inspire us uh, and remind us, like sort of what makes us tick too. I think, I think. You know, and that's a bit of our soloing too, maybe, right? Like engineers think a certain way, and maybe environmental people think a certain way, and um, and we don't often have you know artists at the table too, right? <laughs> and so we, we probably need to um, to really uh, like the radical transformations we're talking about. Well, um, Mashiat, is that how you say it? Yeah, it's Mashiat. Mashiat, Mashiat had a had a lovely question in the chat about creation being a privilege, and if only those who are able to create are creating and innovating, um, then it, that itself becomes a kind of privilege. And uh, she asks, how do how can we promote a truly collaborative environment where we're building a sustainable environment for all, and not only the ones with the most power and voice? I think at some level, part of that has to do with how we conceive of creativity and who we conceive of as a creator. And so many of the hierarchies that we inherit have to do with our habits of identifying certain folks as the creators and everyone else is sort of tagging along. But from a very different standpoint, from the standpoint say of social design, you might begin with a different assumption, which is that everyone's a creator. That in fact, improvisation is ubiquitous. The people are always tinkering with what they have and working with the circumstances at hand in whatever way they can. What would it mean to enter into a creative and transformative process by beginning with those everyday modes of tinkering and transformative imagination rather than again, uh, turning to the experts to tell us what this place should look like or what these people should be doing. That I think is the orientation that in my mind animates some of the more interesting experiments in more equitable design. And this is something of what we're trying in, in the collaborations that, that we've started with two African-American organizations based in South Baltimore that are involved in questions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and um, different kinds of waste practices. Um, so yeah, I think that a lot in fact turns on the relationships that the, 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 the relationships that we put into place between experts and ordinary people. If we can loosen up that distinction between expertise on the one hand and ordinary life on the other, and really enter into any situation with a commitment to finding the expertise that is already there, right? Whether it's a certain kind of environmental awareness, right? Knowledge of what happens in this place, knowledge of what grows in this soil, uh, knowledge of what works well with this people as opposed to not working so well. There are all of these ways, I think, that, um, that we can begin in a sense with what people know and what they're familiar with and try to figure out then how to get together somewhere else. I don't know how that sounds as an answer. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That That's almost uh, what we talked about in class as well, where we talked about an expert doesn't mean they have all the answers, but they may have, you know, lived their life studying this, but that doesn't mean that a community member doesn't have that understanding as well because they have lived through it. So your response definitely made a lot of sense. Thank you. It's uns I'll just say one more thing, though, you see, like, because I, I don't want to, uh, this is not, this is, a, this, is a, this is a more radical proposition than it might otherwise appear to be. And the reason is that if we really take that seriously, it will, like, a time will come where we have to ask ourselves, what does this do to the vision that we have? Like the environmentalism that we come out 
of the environmentalism that comes out the back end then might look very, very different. You see, it may not, it may not have the same commitments that we start with. It, it may not, um, it may not even look like an environmentalism that we're familiar with. But my feeling is that unless we're prepared to go that route at one point or another, we'll either lose people because the vision isn't their own or we'll be forced into position where we have to treat them once again as objects. And then ask the question, well, how best do we manipulate them such that they will come along? Um, I think we're about to wrap up, but um, I kind of had one more question for you guys and then we can move on to closing remarks. Um, but are there any behavior changes that you think we, everyone here in this um, discussion should make? Um, and especially also for undergraduates, is there anything that we can do to continue to kind of um, stay proximate to these issues and um, help? There's so many things you can do. <laughs> I think it's, I think we've, we've had a really interesting conversation that's gone very sort of specific examples of what and how people think or don't perform certain behaviors to what perhaps are strategies for broad, structural, broad societal shifts in thinking. Um, I think I think something is um, to remember sort of scalability of what people can do, whether it's um, making decisions about your food and your diet, um, your transportation, your personal impacts um, from your housing. And um, I, I think, um, I think with any specific behavior change, there, there are ways to think about it in um, design such that you're more likely to be successful in accomplishing that behavior change. Uh, and I think to be successful at this point in your life, pick something that you're really passionate and, and think is important and work on that. Um, okay, um, let's, let's, we, I feel like we have time for another question. So we'll check um, the chat, but, um, um, oh, can you talk about whether it was government policy that drastically changed the cigarette culture in America or, um, or was it the individual? And I guess this also ties into like, how does, what role does the government play in all of this? Yeah, I mean, in the U.S. context, I'll speak to that because every country is a little bit different with their place in the tobacco epidemic. But um, it, there was, you know, sort of everything was perfect in terms of more and more people smoking. We capped out around mid 60 percent of um, adults between, you know, 18 to 34 using cigarettes at some point um, in the 50s and 60s. And then what what sort of changed was the it was a scientific um, conclusion that tobacco smoke um, hurt people. Uh, and what really changed sort of some of the environmental issues that we're talking about was when there was the discovery that secondhand smoke was super dangerous too. And that shifted the argument from, the tobacco industry was brilliant in framing the behavior as a personal choice, right? You're an adult, you can do this behavior, you can choose to do this. Um, and that is your right, you know, the construct of a smoker's right. The smokers don't like the rights are not protected in any body of constitutional uh, <laughs> authorship in this country. Uh, it's not a protected behavior. Um, the once we had an understanding that tobacco smoke pollution, the secondhand smoke impacted other people, it shifted, right? Because it was like those people should not have to be subjected to something that was dangerous. And so um, I think I think really sort of that orientation in the US context about individual rights um, was really critical and important in how public health played um, or focused on shifting that from the um, user's behavior and um, freedoms associated with that to the impacts on other people. Mm -hmm. um, if I could jump in on that, I, it, it's to me that is, really important reminder of the importance of a kind of relational awareness, uh, of a kind of awareness that uh, the, the ability 
to see things beyond discrete context. Like the, the toxicity of American individualism has to do with our learned inability to imagine consequences beyond restricted domains. We draw a box around the individual and think of everything within that box as though nothing was happening outside it. And yet again and again, whether it is secondhand smoke or tailpipe emissions or um, what happens to people down the road when the rich people up, uh, upstream uh, protect all the resources that they have, but then let everything else uh, downstream. I mean, there's, there's a bazillion levels at which the failure to see consequences beyond the more proximate domain you care about has these ecological effects or eventualities. So the way I see it in terms of the previous question, I think that the most important thing that we as environmentalists can cultivate is and encourage, in fact, is that relational awareness, not just the relational awareness that comes to, that has to do with any specific problem here, are the relationships that you shouldn't forget with regard to this, but to think proactively, you know, how do I develop my capacity to intuit those connections beyond the customary scales at which I am ordinarily inclined to think. And I've come to think of that as, uh, as, as uh, I think of that in terms of having an open mind. And to me, the foundation of any ecological ethics is that capacity to see things in a more expansive way and in a more relational way. And that kind of open-mindedness, I personally think is the most important thing that we can cultivate when it comes uh, to sustainable behavior change. I, yeah, I think that's a great strategy. Okay. No, thank you guys so much. That was, that was a very good answer to my <laughs> heavy question. Um, and I, I just feel like there's been such a great conversation going and I, I would love to just keep going for much longer because there's so many other questions that I have now that are just kind of starting to creep into my mind, but I know that we need to wrap it up. Um, so Masha and Talia, is there anything else we need to mention? Uh, we could send Dr. Pandian's video that he yeah. sent to morning. It's a really wonderful video if, if we, anyone's interested in ocean pollution, uh, water pollution, plastics, uh, please check it out. Um, but other than that, I think we are set. We want to thank um, both Dr. Kennedy and um, Pandian uh, for joining us this evening. This has been an awesome an event. Um, learned so much. Um, and I think there's just been a lot of great um, ideas shared and thoughts raised. A lot of what we've talked about is um, very relatable to you know everything that's going on in the world with the environment, as well as honestly what's going on in the world with regards to the pandemic. So much of what we we're talking about tonight, I was like, oh, this goes back to what I can use when I'm talking to my family about you know. Um, not meeting with people outside their family or wearing masks and trying to encourage uh, changes, whether they are sustainable in the sense of long-term or just the short-term. Um, but yeah, so great, great conversation. Um, we will be um, sending out a follow-up email to everyone who registered with the recording of the video. Um, we just posted the polls. So if you get a chance to complete that, please um, do that. And um, again, uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions for um, either of our speakers, we will send out their contact information as well. So thank you all so much for coming tonight and have a good rest of your semesters. Good luck on finals.